Welcome to the 81st Annual Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is on targeting cancer. My name is Paula Kaburstis. I'm an editor at Science Magazine, and I have the pleasure of speaking today with Dr. Karen Chiskowski, who's at Harvard Medical School. Karen is an expert on RAS signaling and the RAS oncogene. Um, RAS is particularly important in cancer because it's highly mutated in many different cancers, and in particular in the most lethal cancers. Karen, how did you become interested in RAS? Well, I actually became interested in RAS um, because it is one of the most commonly deregulated genes and pathways in human cancer. And not only are there RAS mutations in a broad spectrum of human tumors, but you often find genetic alterations that function upstream or downstream of RAS. So that really covers all, all the cancers. Um, I think when the gene was discovered, or mutations in the gene were discovered 35 years ago, people thought that um, it would be relatively easy to target it because it was an activated protein. And that has turned out not to be the case. Can you explain why? Well, it has to do with the chemistry, although I will say that people are making strides mm -hmm. in targeting the RAS protein itself. Mm -hmm. However, there are many other approaches that one can take to develop therapies for RAS-driven cancers, and so that's what we've been working on um, okay. in the meantime while people uh, develop this magic okay. drug. So tell us about that. You're working on some of the genes in the pathway. You're targeting the other proteins in the pathway. Mm -hmm. so, so what sorts of things are you doing? So I firmly believe that in order to develop a therapy for any RAS-driven tumor, you have to hit part of the RAS pathway. So you have to either hit the ras mac erk pathway or the PF3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway. But the key is to try to figure out other drugs that you can add on to those agents to cause durable tumor regression. Mm -hmm. And so there are several approaches to do this. I think one approach that's been very successful is to think about the other types of vulnerabilities, the non-oncogenic vulnerabilities that are in a cancer cell and try to co-target those. So you can imagine that perhaps you could develop a therapy by targeting part of the RAS pathway and then capitalizing on responses to DNA damage or oxidative stress or proteotoxic stress, mm -hmm. things like that. So you've been testing such therapies in mouse models? Yes, so we always start with human cells and we develop hypothesis and test as many human cell lines as possible and sometimes human xenografts. And then we test our agents in genetically engineered mouse models. And those have been very powerful because every animal that develops a tumor is different, just mm -hmm. like any human that develops a tumor. The, the genetics of that tumor are different. And so you're able to test a specific combination in a large number of animals, patient, mouse patients, um, and look to see which of these combinations work. Now, I think the important uh, consideration is that we're not looking just to slow tumors down. We are looking for frank tumor regression. So we want the tumors to melt away. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I started off developing genetically engineered mouse models to try to create animals that got cancer, and that was very um, rewarding. But it is much more rewarding to see a tumor shrink. Um, mouse models sometimes get a bad rap, especially from pharmaceutical companies who um, take on faith that drugs that have shown efficacy in mice are going to work out in the clinic. Um, and I know you're constantly improving the models, but, but what's your general reaction to the frustration that, that you hear sometimes from Well, yeah, so I think that actually in order to develop effective therapies, we need to take a variety of approaches. So mm -hmm. people perform cellular screens in a two-dimensional dimensional culture dish, but that doesn't really uh, accurately mimic a tumor in a patient, but that is valuable. Xenografts are valuable, they're human cells. Um, Patient-derived xenografts are valuable, but they don't have an intact immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, genetically engineered mouse models are valuable because they have an intact immune system. Um, so I think the goal is to use a variety of approaches, which, which I do actually in my own research. Um, 
But I think that some of the reasons why drugs don't work or specific therapies don't work in humans versus a mouse model is because sometimes we're not able to, to dose humans the same as we are mouse models, either because of toxicity, mm -hmm. and in many instances, we're not measuring pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics, and so we don't even know if we have effectively hit the target in our in humans. And so what we try to do to uh, prevent that is when possible, we try to recapitulate the dosing that's used in humans. We do extensive PK and PD studies. Mm -hmm. And then when we develop clinical trials with our clinical partners, we try to incorporate PK and PD in those human studies as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, my, my feeling is that when things don't work, it's usually because the same experiment wasn't done. Um, so to get back to your combination therapies, I've been reading some of your recent papers and um, that work has taken you into epigenetics. Yes. Um, so tell us about that. Well, um, if you think about it, oncogenes in many instances drive many cancers, but the ultimate transcriptional output of any oncogenic signal is likely to be determined and dictated by the epigenetic state of a cell. Mm -hmm. And we're becoming more and more aware of uh, the mutations in epigenetic regulatory enzymes. And so you have mutations in oncogenes and the mutations in epigenetic enzymes. And so how do they interact and do they interact? And so we noticed in several different tumor types that we would see a specific interesting oncogenic mutation and a specific interesting epigenetic mutation. And we originally started trying to co-target these sort of as, an, an, as a, um, an orthogonal approach, thinking that that might work. Well, it turns out that in every instance where it works, there is some nodal point of convergence. And so that, I think, is what's um, causing the vulnerability, and that's what we're actually able to capitalize on in these combination therapies. Mm -hmm. So one of the um, drugs that you're working with is this bromodomain inhibitor. Um, how far along is that work? Um, is it in mice, or have you... Um, there are bromodomain inhibitors that are in clinical trials for other indications, mm -hmm. and the hope is that those inhibitors will have some clinical activity in individuals that have a very specific alteration um, that the bromodomain inhibitors are targeting. So if, if, if those bromodomains continue, inhibitors continue to be developed clinically, which I'm very optimistic about, the next goal is to uh, develop combination therapy. So we're trying to develop a combination therapy right now with the bromodomain inhibitors and the MEK inhibitors, which is what we saw working very well in our animal models. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very optimistic. I think it's going, it's, it's going well. There are many companies that have bromodomain inhibitors. I think right now we have to wait to see which one will be the best. Um, and really it's the clinical experiment. It's the trials that will determine that. Right. And you're in a good place, Harvard Medical School. You're surrounded by clinicians and near Kendall Square with all the drug companies. Yes, so, yeah. I have to say that that's quite valuable and the Cancer Center really makes an effort to um, bring in uh, pharmaceutical companies on a regular basis so that we get that interface and that interaction and we hear about the new drugs as they're being developed. Mm -hmm. um, and again, our clinical par uh, partners are, are invaluable. So it's really that back and forth, bench to bedside, and bench side bench to uh, back to bench uh, okay. approach that's been really useful. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much for talking. Great, with us. thank you.